I think we have a lot of exciting things to talk about. Uh, what I would like to do is start off by having each of us just uh, provide a little bit of information about what the last three months have been like um, in our roles and where we see things going. And so just for a little bit of background for all of you who are tuning in about myself, um, as Rashmi mentioned, uh, I'm a professor um, in the Decision Risk and Operations group. And over the last year, I've actually been on sabbatical at New York Presbyterian um, and have uh, had the pleasure of, of interacting with Emmy a bit during the past year. And the last three months have been um, a bit of a whirlwind where I've been working with a number of people within NYP on the data analytics side of things, trying to understand uh, how the data that we are seeing coming out from different countries, how the data we see uh, coming out internally uh, can be used to help inform some of the operational decisions that are being made. What do we expect uh, is going to come? How many hospital beds do we think uh, may be needed in the, in the coming weeks and months? And, you know, at the beginning, things were moving very rapidly. And so it was really about just getting some information um, that was based on data rather than, you know, um, letting the demand dictate what's happening, but we wanted to be a little bit more proactive. Uh, now that things are thankfully um, getting better and improving, um, we're, we're looking at trying to look forward looking still on the horizon of the next couple of months. Um, in fact, I've been working with a number of Dean's Summer Fellows. Uh, for those who are not aware, uh, the Dean's Office has sponsored some internships for some of our MBA students. And so I have a team of students who are helping me gather data from different countries um, and using that to try to see what that might tell us about what might be happening in New York going forward. Um, so I'm excited to, to have the conversation today and maybe I'll, I'll start by asking Michelle to tell us a little bit about what um, has been going on for her. Hi everyone, and and thanks again for the for the opportunity to join this discussion. Um, so uh, so I am at Merck, um, and so perhaps before I say a little bit more about what I've been doing personally the last few months, I'll start with what Merck has been doing the last few months, which has been really to focus on. Um, three main areas. So one is, of course, around um, keeping our employees safe. Um, but then secondly, uh, to really ensure supply chain continuity for important medicines, um, both for uh, patients who are involved in clinical trials, as well as patients who are around the world suffering from conditions that, that are um, include, but are not, you know, not exclusively um, focused on, on COVID-19 and managing actually quite a bit of supply chain um, issues and, and, um, and constraints around getting some of those uh, important medicines to patients on time. Um, and then finally, um, Merck has been um, one of the contributors and participants in what has been, I think, a really tremendous worldwide effort of collaboration across um, not only companies, but also research institutes um, uh, and, uh, and other bodies to start to get the work underway to, to, look at, um, to look at what vaccines and therapeutic options can be brought to bear to, to manage this ongoing issue. Um, from a personal uh, perspective, I have been um, holed up in our home in northern New Jersey with um, my husband and two young children and, and managing a lot of the issues that others have been managing with um, coping with uh, childcare and homeschooling and all of that. Um, but at the same time, part of my role from a business point of view um, at Merck has been to lead um, some of our business strategic thinking on how to respond to uh, this changing world, um, particularly in the area of digital transformation. Um, you know, I think there's it, probably everybody has seen this um, little image that's gone around on, on LinkedIn and other areas that ask what is driving our digital transformation? Is it, you know, is it your CEO? Is it your, your CTO? Or is it COVID-19? And I think that's been very much the world that we're living very, very rapidly trying to, um, to pivot our, our business model and our um, offerings for customers so that they are um, relevant in what has been, um, you know, a very challenging time. So 
that's about a summary, um, Carrie, of, of what, what we've been doing. Great, thanks, Emmy. So um, thank you very much for having uh, me today. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, although Zooming seems to be a full-time occupation and I would love to once again actually have opportunities to be in person with people. Uh, so uh, I think most of you know that New York Presbyterian was at the epicenter of the epicenter um, of COVID-19 at the height we had over 2,500 patients uh, at our uh, institution. We're 10 campuses. Uh, normally we have 4,000 beds. We surged to more like 6,000 beds almost. We went from uh, 400 ICU capacity to over 900 ICU beds. Um, and we um, had our first patient on March 2nd we were by the middle by the beginning of april we had 1500 patients and by the middle of april we had over 2500 and all along the way we were dealing with um, how to pro provide care to patients um, who were extraordinarily sick um, and we had to do what you've all read in the literature, deal with PPE shortages, swab shortages, ventilators shortages, dialysis shortages. We built field hospitals in addition to the field hospitals that the federal and the state um, built. Uh, and um, I can safely say that the front line um, were truly heroic people um, that I am proud to be a part of New York Presbyterian. I, for one, was far away from the front line. I was at the hospital, but I was really working on some predictive modeling uh, and then spent a great deal of time on trying to set up the various uh, redeployment models that we were putting in. And then uh, we had one person who was spending their time doing financial modeling, um, trying to figure out what where what what was happening um, from a volume and from um, a financial um, viewpoint. Uh, and then we spent a fair amount of time actually working on discharge planning. Uh, we recognized pretty early on that discharge planning was going to become pretty critical. Um, the first wave of patients um, tended to leave pretty quickly. Um, we found that the uh, length of stay or uh, occupied uh, length of stay is in, as much as 24 days. So these patients are very sick and they're very difficult to place. So that was what we were up to in strategy. At the same time as we were trying to update where we were, what I fondly call as BC, uh, before COVID um, so that we could start to figure out where we were going um, after COVID. Great, thanks. And um, I think that both of you touched on some topics regarding how the system has adapt, had to adapt very rapidly. I mean, you, some of the numbers you quoted are astonishing how quickly things uh, changed within the NYP system. Um, and so I, I, it would be great to hear how you think this, what are some of the long-term effects uh, that we are going to see on the hospitals, um, on the supply chain, Michelle, as you alluded to, uh, and just kind of the infrastructure that we see the healthcare system uh, being built upon. And what are some of the lessons that we can, can learn from all of this? Who do you like? Go for it, Emmy. We'll have you go first. Okay. Time. So, um, I, I, again, the biggest lesson is, is that when you close down your ambulatory uh, practices uh, and your elective surgery, you will find people adapt to telehealth um, in an unbelievably fast way. Um, from a personal point of view, um, my husband's an orthopedic surgeon, and despite the fact I pleaded with him for uh, five years to try it, he didn't try it till uh, I think it was March 17th. Uh, my best friend is a rheumatologist, and she had never tried it until March 17th. So March 17th seemed to be 
it's 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 a new new game. We are um, averaging, you know, uh, um, probably ninety thousand telehealth visits a, a month. Um, we have twenty five percent of our practice to, to today is uh, telehealth, and there's been a minor dip with the opening up, but um, there's no question that telehealth is going to, I think, transform the way patients um, get their care. Um, from the supplies change, since you mentioned that, uh, I worked two years ago on developing a strategy that uh, went sort of almost beyond just in time, um, trying to figure out how we could get supplies from the loading dock to the nursing units quicker so that we could actually have less supplies. I think that we learned in this pandemic that we had to rethink our supply chain. And I think we will have a large facility that will store a lot of the PPE and ventilators and the like that we were in very short supply um, over the last six weeks. We went from using 4,000 masks a day to the, the height almost using 100,000 masks a day. And that's just the beginning of the, the story. So every week was another challenge. Um, remote work, ma work um, just as telehealth is radically changing, I think a lot of the jobs that we thought had to be in person, on site, we've learned can be remote and can be just as effective. So I think we have to rethink the whole organizational structure of, of uh, how we think about who goes to work and how often people go and how do you deal with the Zooms and, and how, do you, how do you orient new people who haven't been part of the team? I think there's a whole lot of adjusting and there's adjusting to the fact that people with young children who live in New York, it's difficult to work from home. So I think there's a whole lot we need to learn about that, but that's definitely. Another area is upskilling. We learned that we need to do much better job of training our nurses to be able to be more flexible in terms of ICU coverage and the same with ICU, some of the ICU skills of nurses, same with physicians, the hospitalists to be trained to be able to do some ICU capabilities. So I think we, and the number of ICU beds that we have to have and the flexibility. So I think we are radically looking at a changed healthcare system. Thanks, Michelle. Yes. Um, well, I certainly agree with um, with 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 everything that Emmy has has said. Um, I think as we've as we've been looking at it from a from a strategy point of view, um, to me, they sort of look at it in, from two angles. So one is the downward pressures piece, and then the other aspect is you know what is the innovation and what are the catalysts that have been in place um, this year that are actually will ultimately help healthcare systems succeed in the future um, and maybe to begin by kind of focusing on the downward pressures you know that those are many so we see across the world and we take a global view here um, a significant period of austerity coming that will impact healthcare systems all over the world um, and that's both in terms of governments who are obviously at the moment trying to prop up economies and fund um, fund a, cr a crisis moment, um, but also healthcare providers who are in um, major financial distress um, in in some countries, uh, as well as patients who you know may be unemployed, have lost insurance, um, and will be you know really falling through the cracks from a from a healthcare coverage perspective in 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 years to come potentially, depending on how long the economic recessions um, extend for. Um, so I think from an, from an overall economic climate perspective, that's, that's going to be very challenging. Um, from, a, from a supply chain point of view, since you um, asked that question specifically, um, we've seen you know, a, a, a major demand and, and clamoring, in fact, from, from national governments to say we want supply chain for medicines to be close to us in our countries. Um, it, it is not sufficient. We don't want to see that a supply chain footprint um, is residing primarily 
in, in countries that are on the other side of the world, because when, when it comes to crunch time, we want to know that we have the inventory and we have the access to medicines that our citizens need. So we're expecting from a you know, policy point of view um, to see a sort of move from globalization to national, nationalization sorts of policies that might impact supply chain. Um, and that would obviously be a very big deal for for many for many companies to try to think through how to, how to do that and how to respond to that. Um, on the other hand, um, from an innovation point of view, as was said earlier, um, you know we've all seen those headlines that say you know ten years of innovation in ten weeks um, sort of occurring, um, and these constraints that have very rapidly uh, driven adoption of telemedicine as as emmy said as well as um you know a much greater i think openness to thinking about technology and the role of technology in one's own personal healthcare management you know, some of those areas that we've been looking at for years um that didn't seem to be making any traction uh like the patient as the ceo of my health or um how ai is used to to um help to get to better diag better diagnostics um have become you know fairly normalized in a very rapid period of time, but also accompanied with regulatory um, and changes and reimbursement changes that actually allow healthcare professionals to, to offer new services and be paid for it, um, that we expect that those will, will be sustained over, over time. So um, it's a very dynamic, it's a very, very dynamic space right now. And I think for, for those of us who kind of work in strategy functions, it's really a very interesting time to think how to think through how you really scenario plan in in such a dynamic space. Okay. Can I make one, one more Please. one more comment? You know, I, I, on a on a bigger a bigger scale than than I think as a country, um, we really need to think about uh, how we reimburse for healthcare and social services. And we really need to think about combining social services and healthcare because another outgrowth of this pandemic is just highlighting for the umpteenth time the challenges of racial equity. And we need to really figure out how do we reduce disparities um, both socially, economically, and um, health care wise. And I really think it's a call to, to rethink how we fund social service, because 80% of how we spend our health care dollars is really not on health care, it's on social services. So I just think we need, a, on a federal level, we really need to rethink um, how we fund our social service and health care. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, great point. Um, and unfortunately, as you highlighted, Emmy, there, this epidemic has highlighted and put right in front of everybody's faces how disadvantaged populations are even more dis became even more disadvantaged. Um, and so I think um, I love that you touched on changing both the reimbursement system to protect some, some of these communities um, to provide access to care, uh, but also that some of the challenges are not just on getting access to the healthcare, but it, it happens even before that, before the, the healthcare is needed and, and the, the social aspects. Um, I think what I, I heard from both of you was, was really interesting in terms of the amount of innovation that occurred. And it's interesting because at the beginning of the uh, outbreak, many people came up to me and asked, you know, why weren't there contingency plans put in place for outbreaks? And my response was that, you know, I could point you to hundreds of papers that look at disaster planning, right? So there are papers that came out in the last couple of years calling, saying if there was a flu-like outbreak. And it addressed some of these challenges, but I think that the, the, the issue was it wasn't at the forefront of people's minds. And so it was hard to naturally adopt them. Um, but now 
by being forced to uh, over the past couple of months, I think this is a, a great opportunity to, to leverage these lessons um, and uh, keep it going forward and adopting over the next coming months and years going forward. Um, I think one of the challenges is that there's, there's talk of a possibility of a second wave. Um, there's questions of whether or not we are even out of the first wave. Um, as a nation, uh, you know, the numbers in New York are trending downwards um, on the national level. They are, are still moving in the positive, uh, increasing. Um, and so it would be, I would love to hear from both of you uh, what is being done in the, your institutions and, and generally in the industry to prepare for this or the possibility that we're going to see repleted flare up. So maybe it won't be at the same scale as we saw um, here right now, um, but it's going to be peaking. Uh, it's going to be increasing and waning and increasing and waning over the next coming weeks and months. Emmy, you're unmuted, so why don't you go first? <laughs> okay. Um, so we are anticipating a surge likely, first of all, no one knows what's going to happen. It's as likely to look at the pandemic of 1918 to see those, the three waves of of surges. Uh, I think you're seeing some kind of surge that's going on in China. Um, but I think that the best estimates we have right now is that there'll be some surge in September when people get back really into the, the city potentially. And we're looking at potentially another surge in December. Um, we're expecting them to be um, not nearly of the same magnitude as we've experienced, um, partly because we think there's been some kind of, um, it's, I wouldn't call it herd immunity, but some kind of immunity given the, the large um, uh, size of the people that were affected. Uh, and we are looking at our ICU. We're looking at, at just what I said, the upskilling. We're not anticipating having to close elective surgery again, but we've made plans on how to um, increase our ICU capacity in up upskilling our, our employees so that they can manage the, the surge. And clearly we are preparing for our PPE and other related um, and end you know, moving forward, just as Michelle said, making sure that all of our masks don't come from Wuhan, China, and all of our swabs don't come from Northern Italy. Um, and that speaks to just the tip of the iceberg of having a much more distributed uh, supply chain sources. Great, thanks. Michelle? Um, so on the medicine side, I guess two things. One is on supply chain, um, just to pick up um, where Emmy left off on supply chain. Um, you know, I think we we did run into um, periods of constraint um, this year on on medicines in the in the area of anti infectives and those medicines, some other medicines that are used to um, support ventilation um, and related procedures. Um, and, it, it, you know, in another call out for adopting innovation, I think as an organization, we've, be, we've really beefed up our, our capabilities in using it, um, advanced analytics to be able to predict where needs um, may arise um, and, and to become more sophisticated to plan for future um, outbreaks if those, if those do arise, to be able to predict them and, and to be able to supply them. Um, obviously, from an total industry point of view, there's a huge focus on therapeutics um, so that even if there are uh, further outbreaks that those that those can be better managed with with better therapeutic options and more information about what works, um, as well as a focus on bringing vaccines to bear. I learned just this week that there are and I was astonished to hear it. There are 550 development programs occurring across the biopharma world and research institutions um, in, um, in the exploration of, of um, therapeutic and vaccine options, um, which is kind of, it's really astonishing. Um, and it also, I think what's so interesting is you see a kind of level of collaboration that um, is, you know, dare I say, unprecedented, such a cliched word um, this year, but um, 
uh, really extraordinary um, collaboration, even amongst groups that may have otherwise have be considered competitors. Um, and I think it gives us probably some hope or optimism that as we think about these other bigger challenges for the future, that that kind of level of collaboration, breaking down barriers between groups will have a, have a lasting effect as we, as, we, as we continue to tackle big healthcare problems. Um, so that's on the medicine side. On the, on the ways of working um, side of things, so, you know, the, I think most of us expect, um, again, as Emmy has already alluded to, that remote working will become much more central um, in order to be equipped to manage uh, further outbreaks. Um, and, you know, we've all become, become much more au fait and, and upskilled around how to do that more effectively. Um, and, and expect to be, to be um, putting remote working at the center of our ways of working probably for quite some time. So Carrie, the one thing that, that I think Michelle and I didn't mention, but is certainly key to our strategy is testing. So we were completely hamstrung when we began in early March with, with testing. And I know you're gonna to get to it in another question, but that's another thing that we've worked very hard to be able to have as we faced another surge would have readily available enough, both antibody testing as well as the COVID positive testing. Right, thanks, Amy. So I guess while you bring it up, <laughs> maybe we can expand upon that a little bit. And, and as you mentioned, um, the initial rollout uh, really limited the ability to identify people who were infected um, and also to, to minimize the spread because uh, if we didn't know who was infected, we didn't know who needed to be quarantined. Um, and it, it sounds like things are getting better, uh, but there are questions that people have been posing out there. Um, you know, once people return back to work, um, you know, how often are people going to be tested? Um, and how are we going to use testing to, how do we roll it out? And, and how do we base decisions on the results of testing? And I, I think that we need to be very frank that these tests are not perfect. So there are false negatives. Um, people can test negative, but they could be infected. Um, false positives are, are less common, um, which is at least a, a good thing. Um, but, but the fear is that if, if um, we're missing people who are infected, um, you know, they are still going out uh, and there's always going to be risks, I think, until a vaccine uh, is made available. But how do we start thinking about testing going forward? And I guess maybe within NYP, what's kind of the strategy and thought process around testing? Um, so testing is, a, is um, the ultimate um, changing dy dynamo um, because there is so much unknown about this disease um, and so and there so one has you know the temperature checks and one day that's a meaningful indication of whether someone might be COVID positive and you test those people and the next day you hear that there are a lot of asymptomatic that are, don't have temperature that are potentially um, infectious um, and so how do you handle those you you have the the uh, antibody tests and if they're positive you might be immune and then we don't know how long that immunity will last so I think that um, we have changed our policy over the last three months meant multiple times as to who gets tested when they get tested I think the most important thing right now Carrie is that we have enough tests testing capacity so that between the city and the hospitals, we can, you know, be able to be respond to whatever's being discovered along the way to help educate us is what's the best way to protect us. Um, so I think that's going to evolve over the next two months. And that I, I, I believe that the capacity is the most important thing that we can drive at right now in the absence of knowing a strict roadmap. Because if I told you what we're doing today, I promise you by August, I would be telling you something for not, not astronomically different, but significantly different as to what 
the rules are. Thank you. Michelle, do you want to weigh in or um, I also wanted to build on something you said earlier um, about the 550 different uh, projects that are going at, at different places. Um, and so I, I was hoping that um, you could also expand upon that and um, how the industry is thinking about balancing between vaccine development, therapeutics and treatments, and then also you know, yes, COVID is affecting everybody's lives dramatically right now, but there are other diseases as well. So how do you balance across thinking about other um, products as well in your portfolio? Hmm. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, I think the general approach has been across the industry to start with thinking about um, um, therapeutics as, have, as having a sort of somewhat lower bar in terms of um, companies being able to scan their existing libraries of assets and then figure out which of those might actually have applicability for treatment of um, of COVID-19. So I think we've seen some success from, from players um, in that area and you know I think probably all of us at least the, the, the bigger um, um, firms have have done extensive um, reviews of our of our libraries for that that purpose. So I, you know, in general, um, getting to therapeutics has seemed like a, a lower bar. At the same time, you know, we all have seen the headlines on um, vaccines, and, and Merck is one of the companies that is um, participating in um, in in the collaboration to to look at vaccine development. Um, um, and Merck has a has a significant legacy in this area, um, and in fact, um, just in the last few years, we were we were um, the the one that um, brought the Ebola vaccine to bear um, and was approved um, in the last few years um, for use. But um, having said that, you know, even with all that heritage and legacy, our scientists, you know, will be the first to say that it's very difficult to develop a vaccine. It's not a slam dunk. Um, and then once, and then once you've got a vaccine and it and it is demonstrated to be safe um, and effective, uh, then you've got to actually manufacture it, and that's obviously not easy either. Um, um, particularly for vaccines, right? The, the challenges around manufacturing can be can be significant. So, um, in general, you know, I think the industry response has been the more. Um, participation the better because we need lots of shots on goal because it's so high risk um, and because you're going to need multiple parties who are actually manufacturing to be able to get doses vaccine doses to the world's population um, and you know I think the quote that I heard from our, our CEO Ken Frazier um, in the last few weeks was you know if, if one person if one person um, um, has has uh, this virus, then we're all at risk, and so you know we are all need to be part of a mission to make make the this these um, vaccine options available very broadly across the world um, at affordable prices. Um, the second part of your question, Carrie, was around how you think about uh, development for other areas, and it's true that in um, in some respects it's been um, it's been an, a very important priority to manage clinical trial um, uh, progress and to ensure that, uh, particularly for patients who are already in trials, that they're continuing to have the ability to, um, to participate and to, um, to actually um, get the interventions that are needed, as well as have access to, um, to the medicine that's, that's under investigation. Um, and keeping those trials up and running and on track has been, has been um, equally a, a priority for our R&D organization. Thank you. Uh, Reshmi, I think that what I would like to do uh, now is, is turn over uh, to the audience to, to ask questions. I, I see that there have been some coming in. Uh, maybe I'll defer to you to read them aloud and, and then let the rest of us pipe in uh, as appropriate. That sounds good. So everyone, you can type in your questions into the Q&A box. Um, I'll start with one that was actually submitted a bit earlier. How do you see COVID affecting the adoption and use of predictive analytics in healthcare systems? For example, tools that predict a hospitalized patient may need ventilation in the next 24 hours, become septic, et cetera. 
Um, we already use predictive modeling uh, and uh, to uh, especially related to imaging and and what the predictions are about who's going to have lung cancer or not. Uh, we use predictive modeling around our length of stay. Um, so there is no question that the power of predictive modeling will be uh, business decisions. The challenge, of course, is having good data going in and the data governance issues around the data analytics is an enormous challenge that all of us need to face. There has to be common definitions of variables. There has to be um, a, a, a real streamlining of the data capture uh, and streamlining of the cleanliness. And I can speak a, a little bit about what's been going on um, recently related to COVID and also kind of on the research front. So a, a colleague at uh, Columbia Business School, Asad Zivi, uh, has been working um, and deployed a predictive model uh, for patients in, um, in the ICU at risk of deteriorating. And so they actually deployed it at a number of hospitals within Israel and their COVID wards. Um, and so you can see in this particular example, especially because uh, the needs of these patients are so large um, and when there's high demand, it, this type of model and the alerts helped guide the physicians to the most at-risk patients. Um, and so that's some examples of where this is being directly integrated. Uh, another example is related to what Emmy said is on the imaging side of things, uh, especially early on in the epidemic when PPE was so limited. Um, somebody, what, the disease actually, you know, you hear it talk about that it attacks the lungs and so people have a lot of trouble breathing, but it also um, can affect the heart. And so uh, cardiologists would want to get scans of the hearts, but to send a radiologist in a technician to get that scan that would require full PPE and with PPE so limited you want to limit the number of people that need to interact with the patients uh, so there is a, a product that's out there that actually uses predictive modeling to guide where people where to put the probe on a patient's body to get the best images of the heart and so this is one way that if somebody's already in the room they can try to get a scan and maybe it's not perfect, but at least you get some information without necessarily putting somebody else at risk. So you can see that the healthcare system, again, getting to the themes that uh, Emmy and Michelle highlighted earlier, adopting very quickly and, and integrating the technology. So I guess, you know, predictive modeling has been used in healthcare. And I think now the, the last three months have demonstrated how valuable it, it has been and can be. And, and I think that there is a great uh, push to continue in this direction going forward. Next question, somewhat related. Uh, what will increasing storage of PPE, ventilators, etc., do for patient costs? Uh, and where do you see taking funds out to, to accommodate so overall costs don't increase, um, you know, patient costs or insurance costs? I guess that that one's for me too. Uh, so we are, um, as we've done in the past, looking at under every um, possible stone to look at where we can be more efficient. It is obvious that we can be more in efficient in how we're organized. We can be more efficient in the space that we use if we can make more remote, um, reduce our, our space expenses. There are opportunities in unnecessary testing that we still are exploring. There's the opportunity of innovation and using innovation um, as well. I think that the, the, so there's opportunities at looking at existing roles that we don't need anymore because of the changing in the way we do business. I think the real challenges are that we need the regulatory environment needs to change with us in order to make some of the, the, the cost savings possible. And the reimbursement system needs to be more rational in order to, so I go back to this issue of social services 
and, and the issues of, of uh, health care. And I think we really need to rationalize those, those services to take advantage because, again, a lot of health care isn't about health care. It's about, it's, a, it's about poverty. Um, so um, the answer is, is that we will figure out ways in which we will have more uh, supplies but we will be able to um, find savings elsewhere. And it's, again, it's going to be a process of, as we are every year, every year we work on eliminating a couple of hundred million dollars of costs, and that's going to be even higher this year in order to accommodate the loss in revenue. All right. Um, next question, if um, there's no follow-up to that. What do you think are the main infrastructure changes we need to have to facilitate greater adoption of telemedicine? Um, are there any patient outcome implica implications of telemedicine? And then relatedly, do you think there'll be a greater adoption of robots or robotics in terms of telemedicine, but also maybe Michelle, just in terms of kind of development um, of pharma? Well, I can take a, a crack at, 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 um, at the first part at least. Um... So, you know, telemedicine options have been av available for some time, as have other types of applications and technology that can help a person <clears throat> manage their health or, or seek consultation. Um, but the adoption has been very, very slow historically. Um, and <clears throat> in fact, as we kind of look out in the world and look at, um, at investment in in, um, in venture funds and other areas, you know, there's always been this question, and you know, at least in, at least in, in my time of being in the field in the last um, few years, of whether whether the healthcare system was ever really going to change um, and um, and adopt this type of technology. While the technology made perfect sense, adoption has been very slow. So I think some of the barriers for that have been, you know, first and foremost has been around reimbursement. So just the practicalities of getting um, getting coverage for um, for my consultation. Or, or being reimbursed for the consultation that I'm giving um, and embedding that into the infrastructure. I mean, I think it's really very fundamental. Um, and then, you know, I think there's also a psychological issue um, from, you know, from a trust perspective that also seems to have abated this year. And that's, you know, it kind of goes across the board, not just in the context of telemedicine, but also on, you know, the example that Carrie just gave on, on actually trusting models that will tell us um, what a patient outcome might be. Um, you start to see just a much greater acceptance, um, probably just because of the, the constrained environment kind of forcing it, but um, more acceptance um, and, and trust for better or worse, by the way, um, in, in those algorithms. Um, so, um, you know, I think for, as we look at the, 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 the business implications and the strategic implications going forward, there are questions about what, what of this will be sustained into the future, um, I think there are questions about whether um, traditional practices or healthcare providers that have made the pivot, whether they will um, continue on that journey um, in terms of offering virtual healthcare options, or will um, some of the, the startup um, companies in the field who have historically kind of been digitally native, will they actually take the reins um, and, and grow exponentially and, and own that space. So I think we, we have yet to see whether, um, you know, or how much of that will really um, be, be sustained, but it certainly will be sustained at a, at a higher level than it was, you know, before BC, um, as Emmy said, before COVID. Um, and then I probably am less equipped to handle the question on on robotics as it relates to um, to drug development, but I I think in general, you know, you just start to see that adoption of technology across the board, com combined with um, you know the the less human interface that's been uh, been emerging would would probably point to to yes. So I think the reimbursement is key. 
Um, I think license is another requirement that they that they relax the re license requirements. You know, you, you it, it used to be that you didn't get reimbursed and you had to do the consult in your doctor's office, and now they've changed that. They've they haven't moved yet to the idea that if it's a new patient and it's it, the patient is in Washington D.C., you can't do a telehealth visit and get reimbursed. So I think there are a lot of changes that need to happen from a regulatory point of view. And there needs to be, again, I, I think there needs to be some thought in terms of license and what can various alternative providers be able to buy? What can a nurse practitioner, what can a PA provide um, so that we can really um, take advantage of the skill sets that we have as healthcare, healthcare workers? Um, I think trust is critical. I think the other thing is we need to, now that we've had this workflow completely turn around in our workflow as we start to go back to seeing some patients, I think the question is what will recidivism look like? And I think that that will also change if we can think about a different way of organizing physicians and allied professionals work, work days so that there is a bucket of time that they're doing their telehealth visits. For robots, I think the most successful place robots are, bots as they call them, is in the back office. There is no question that we can revolutionize all, no matter what industry you're in, is in the back office for the repeat things that you do for insurance verification and the like, um, and the revenue cycle. Um, and many of those kind of functions can be done by bots and there are great advantages. They do things three times as fast. They don't have any body breaks and they don't get sick or take vacations. So I think there's a huge possibility and great savings um, for bots. But I think the first savings is, is going to be in the back offices. One thing I just wanted to add, and I think because it's a theme that has come up consistently throughout our discussion on the telehealth aspect, I'm working with some physicians at uh, CUMC. And one thing that they highlighted is in the transition to telehealth, there are people from certain communities that don't have a reliable video access. So that limits the type of visits that they can do in a telehealth manner. Um, and so again, I think we need to be cautious going forward. You know, th there's great promise, but we also have to be wary um, how this may increase further the imbalances that we already see in the system. And I guess getting back to Emmy's point, we really need to think about kind of more social support uh, in these communities. But we have an interesting situation right now. Um, there's our, our ENT uh, surgeons Obviously, it's difficult to do a telehealth visit on your ears, nose, and throat unless you have an otoscope. And what they have done is to scan the market to look at what kind of otoscope. And the least expensive one that is very effective, of course, is not FDA approved. So there are issues like that that we need to work on because there's a lot of remote capabilities that we need to add to your basic telehealth visit, which will further revolutionize the ability to do telehealth. And I think we're just at the cusp of what telehealth can do. Absolutely. Great, so shifting focus just a bit, um, next question. What role do you see for impact investors? Those um, you know, more risk loving, focused on social impact, benefit of investment, what role do you see for these guys to support the, uh, the work ongoing to develop vaccines, therapeutics, all, either alongside or complementary to um, government and public funding? Michelle, I'm letting you answer that one. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have a great answer for that one. Um, I think that in general, we've seen that, um, that investment in healthcare more broadly has increased. Um, and there has been obviously a lot of interest in um, in participating in um, helping to find solutions for the problems that we've we've discussed today. Um, and I also think that um, back to the earlier point, some of the barriers that have been in place around why I may not be an investor. 
um, in terms of skepticism um, around adoption of new technology, um, will those barriers are starting to come down. And so, so we will see a further influx, I think, of, of capital into the space um, more generally. Uh, you know, my, my answer to, to the question is, is that the biggest challenge of those investors is the long lead time for approval by providers. And obviously we made decisions in instantaneously over the last three months, but I can assure you, we will go back to the same kind of, maybe it won't be 14 months or 18 months, maybe it will be nine months, but there'll still be a lot of scrutiny over the, these innovations because of a myriad of reasons. Um, but but that, that, that still will be a lengthy time in amongst at least the provider market. Academic modeling is predicting a number, a large number of deaths um, related to suicide and mental health trauma um, in the coming months and years. What kind of planning is occurring to cope with this mental health epidemic, um, both in terms of hospitals and on the pharma side? We obviously um, are at the epicenter having had um, the kind of trauma that our healthcare workers have had over the last three months. Um, we have done a variety of things. We've had sort of three different layers of mental health services that we've offered. Um, most recently, so we had some team-based, we've had a system, a symptom tracker that we've in, implemented that will help people to be able to track their symptoms so that they can, they know when they should be reaching out to get some help. And we also are offering now individual um, uh, visits. Um, but most importantly, we are relooking at our employee assistant program. And I think that's where everybody in across all industries really need to think about what is an employee assistant program and how do we think about it differently than we have before? And how do we make mental health not be looked at pejoratively? Look at it as it is a fact of life and that it is not to be worried about that it's going to impede anybody's success if they have any kind of a history of mental mental health. Um, so I think we have to have a very large discussion as a society, but the way we're looking at it is we really need to think through the various programs that we offer our employees and then really look at our, be an example to the rest of the country on how we think about our EAP program. Yeah, I would I would agree with that very much. So, um, as part of my uh, day job at Merck, um, um, we we cover the the neuroscience um, area more generally, um, and I would say that the conversation around mental health has has been has been increasing right in general um, in the last few years, um, and that will that will continue to be the case for for all of those reasons. Um, Plus others like, um, you know, I, I think one of the very, very tragic consequences of this crisis has been the effects on those people who are living in facilities, um, either assisted living facilities or other types of facilities. Um, and, and, you know, what we, what we learn is, I, I guess, that there is going to be um, a very strong desire Right for for people to um, to to be living in their own homes um, and not in these kinds of facilities. So the need to really um, manage and support patients with um, psychiatric or other um, mental health conditions will be will be very um, very important. Um, and the same kind of applies as you think about neurodegenerative conditions, um, Alzheimer's. Um, and, and other types of, of dementia, and really the, 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 the keen drive I think there will be to, um, to maintain people's lives in their, in their own homes as one, as one of the consequences of, of this year's uh, pandemic. Can you talk very quickly a little bit about uh, the U.S.'s COVID trajectory in comparison to other countries like Germany um, or other regions like Taiwan and other places that have more successfully decreased infections and increased testing. 
Uh, why isn't our trajectory um, more like those other places that again have increased testing and tracing to the point where people can go out safely? More than happy to uh, tread in that, that water. Um, I, I think that we lost the better part of six weeks in terms of uh, testing capabilities, um, which was very unfortunate. And I think that we did not unfortunately take um, the, the power of what I call Rona um, as seriously as we should have. Um, and I think that that resulted in uh, not soon enough uh, of a, unfortunately a lockdown and not soon enough um, of uh, ramping up our testing capabilities and um, really practicing mask and social distancing, which are the pandemic recipes that's been around for 25 years. Um, so um, that I think put us behind the eight ball. I think that moving forward, I, I believe that if we are willing to respect um, having to wear masks and having to social distance, I think we can manage and, um, th this much better if you complement those two with the ability to be tested um, much more aggressively and understand what is the prevalence and be able to use surveillance data to be able to know if there are hotspots at various parts, parts across the country. But I think if we think we can go back to the way we were last February and live our life that way, I think that Rona will once again rule across this country. It's far from over. Um, so I, and I, in, and just to answer the question of Taiwan, Taiwan had experienced SARS, and I think there is a great deal of lessons learned in Asia from SARS that we did benefit from in what we was how we responded to Rona. Yeah, I think it's um, remarkable while, you know, we are three months, more than three months into this, that it's, we still don't know, even within New York City, um, what is the actual number of infections uh, within this city. We have some estimates, but we don't know the true number of people that have been infected. Um, and that's something that's now pervasive throughout the country and, and other places. And I think, um, you know, as Emmy said, many of the Asian countries that had experienced SARS um, had the expertise to do the contact tracing very rapidly. And the culture where wearing masks was widely accepted um, and in, in fact expected. Um, and I think what Germany was able to do was um, learn from what was being done there. And actually, they acted very rapidly there. Um, testing was ca capacity, they ramped it up even before COVID hit within their country. So they were prepared. Um, and unfortunately, the US, um, you know, and you've seen, I'm sure many of you have seen these charts, you know, delays of a couple of days um, can result in many, many more rapid increase in infections. And when we have these delays on the order of weeks, um, that's where things got out of hand.